Good morning. Today I will be reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Thank you, Esteban. It is a great day to be able to worship God and to uh, realize all the good things that God has done for us. It's been interesting watching the survey things come in, and so I'm excited about that. Uh, It's interesting to get your opinions and your comments, and so we've been looking at some of those things. Um, Make sure you get that filled out if you haven't done that already. We want to hear from everybody. And so that's going to be a good thing. And next week, Jerry Houston is going to be here, just so you know. Uh, So we're not going to talk about survey next week. So it'll be the week after before we talk about results that we see in the survey. But we wanted to give you enough time to think about it and enough time to fill things out. And so if you would do that today, that would be great. Make sure everything's in and we'll uh, start trying to figure out what we're doing here. So, how do you feel about worship today? Were you excited about getting up and coming to worship and this is going to be a great day? Or was it more the, oh, it's Sunday? You didn't have to be at work at 8 o'clock. I mean, come on. Were you excited about being able to be here? Or was it more like, oh, not again, wow, we have to come, and all of that? It is great to see Kevin again. That's good. I know that's why you came, just to see Kevin. <laughs> He's worth it. <laughs> just ask his wife. <laughs> but I think we have different ideas about worship. And some people are so excited about it and so on top of things and they're looking forward to what's coming and some people are so dreading it and they just don't want to be here in the first place. So why are they here? Well, you have to, right? Don't you have to? Isn't that why we're here? We have to. God is looking for worshipers. That's what Jesus says. God is looking for people to worship him. So what I want to do today is just look a little bit at what Jesus did with worship and look at what all of that means. Now, did Jesus go to church? Well, in his way, we're going to look at three different times where we see Jesus in a worship setting at least. So turn with me to Luke chapter 2 first and we'll look at the other passage. So Luke chapter 2 and verse 41 This is when Jesus is 12. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And you probably know the rest of the story, how this is when Jesus stays behind and is in the temple and is talking to the priests and the scribes and he's, you know, asking questions, answering questions, uh, being able to talk with them. But I want you to notice this first part, this just introduction to it. His parents went to Jerusalem every year, every single year at Feast of the Passover. That one only comes once a year. Feast of the Passover is important. Jesus shows up with his parents every single year at Feast of the Passover. And you'll remember what the Feast of the Passover is. It is tied back to when Israel was about to come out of Egypt and the death of the firstborn. And that was the last plague. And the angel that came and killed all the firstborn male children passed over 
the houses that had the blood on the doorpost. And Jesus was at that feast of Passover in memory of that event every single time. And you realize that is just symbolic of him putting his blood on our doorpost so that God passes over the sins. I mean, it's incredible that he sat in, in church in their assembly all of that time and listened and realized, this is me. This is what it was about. But, and, and he knew as much or more than anybody about it, and he was going to live it out. It doesn't mean he didn't have questions. He did have questions. In every picture that you see, I did get a picture Maybe not the typical one, because every picture that you see of Jesus, all the artist renderings and things like that, picture a halo around him. And yes, he's still in the middle, and people are still sitting there and talking to him. But this one seems a little bit more human, because all the others seem like, oh, Jesus had all the answers at 12 years old. And that's not what it says. It says he was asking and answering questions. So it's a back and forth. And always we don't quite understand all that we need to. And there's always more questions at those times. But Jesus was very involved in worship at that time. And I think that's an important thing for us to be able to see is from his early life. Every year he goes to Feast of the Passover, every year he is there, every year he is involved with this. And so it just points to the fact of how would we raise our children? Should they be in worship? Should they be here to be able to worship God? Well, they took him every year. They brought him every year. Usually there's a feast of unleavened bread that follows the feast of Passover. And so while Passover is the first Sabbath, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the last Sabbath, there's a week that they spend there. So they went to church for a week there, and it was a very important time. And so Jesus used to worship. He used to talk to people. He went and asked questions at church, and that's what he was doing. And so I think that's a clue for us as to how Jesus responds when He's in worship. We can see that. If his physical life means that he's the example for us, then let's use that because here is the example of how Jesus did when he was young. Interesting that that's the only story we have. Until the time, I mean, other than baby Jesus, until the time when he's starting his ministry at 30, this is the one story that we have of him growing up. And the one story is about worship, and about being in church, and about being there at the time when God's people do worship. The passage that Esteban read to us talks about the temptation. This one occurs when Jesus is 30, and as he is 30, he goes to the Jordan to be tempted by the devil. And what an interesting passage this is. He's led by the Spirit, but in order to be tempted by the devil, there's a lot of powerful forces at work here. And as you see all of this happening, the devil promises great things. There are three temptations that actually occur, the first two that we have. The first one he talks about, you know, you're 40 days without food, and so why don't you turn stones to bread? And he says, it's written, I don't live that way. I live by the word of God. I don't live on bread. And what does he mean he doesn't live on bread? All of us need at least something to eat. You know, if it's not bread, it's donuts, right? I mean, we need something like that to be able to have and to be able to eat. But what he's saying is my first decision is how am I going to treat God? Am I going to respect him? Am I going to use his power for my own personal gain? And the answer is no, I'm not. Not even if it means I don't survive. 
I am not going to do that. I am not going to put that in that place. And so as you look at what he's doing, he's made some decisions early, not even if it means I'm starving to death. And so as you look at this passage, it's a decision on how he's going to treat God. And then the decision is about worship. And Satan takes him and he goes, well, let me just show you all the kingdoms of the earth. And I don't know how he does that in an instant of time, but he says, let me show you every single kingdom. And Jesus came to establish his kingdom, to build his kingdom so that people might be able to come to him. And he says, I'm going to show you every single kingdom and power that there ever is, and I am willing to give it to you because it is within my power to do so. Did you realize that? Is he just bragging here? Or is this really a possibility? That Jesus is in the place where he could fulfill his whole destiny here at one instant. To you I give this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And I give it to whom I will. And that's Satan talking. I can give all the kingdoms of this earth Of course, when you look at what goes on in governments and things around, it's probably not a surprise. Satan says, I've got control of all of them, and I'll give them to you. Only thing you have to do, one thing, is just worship me. All you have to do is just bow down, and all of your destiny, all of that pain of the cross, all of the teaching that you would have had to do prior is all gone in an instant. You just bow down and worship me, and your life has been fulfilled. You will have the greatest success. You're not just building one struggling band of people who's trying to be able to teach others about you. You can have it all, and they will reign over the entire earth and all kingdoms. Jesus says, no, I worship only God. I don't worship anyone else but God. God. That had to be a decision made before any of this. And he says, that's the one thing that I do. I do not worship anyone but God. And so if you had to pick three of the biggest temptations that were ever going to be presented to you, having the success of your life might be one of the biggest ones. But it's interesting that having the success of your life is about worship. And that's the only thing Satan would ask. Why don't you just not worship God? Can we tempt you to do that? If you'll just not worship God, well, then there's a better chance of you worshiping me. And if I can just get you to do that, then I've won the battle. The temptation is complete. And as you look at what he's trying to do here, Jesus says, no, I don't worship anyone but God, and I always worship God. It isn't just that it's, you know, well, take it or leave it. Jesus will not trade worship for success. Worship of God is first and primary. So let me ask you, do you think Jesus went to church? Do you think he would show up? As he comes out of that wilderness, he goes back to his hometown. And in Luke chapter 4, we read about him going back to his own church. Back to the very place where he grew up all of that time in their synagogue. So temple and Passover were more like our worship assembly, but now he goes back to more like Bible class where it's a discussion, where people would talk back and forth, and where they were able to have this discussion. And synagogue was primarily for learning. And so when you read that, and you think about that, and you think about the things that he's doing, it says in Luke 4, verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the synagogue and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, just a couple of things from this passage, not trying to take the whole passage, but Jesus is in Nazareth. It is his hometown. It is his home synagogue. And he goes back to a very familiar place. And you can read this several different ways, as was his custom. So he's usually there. And they're expecting that. He's always there. He went to synagogue on Sabbath day, and then you can put the comma and say, and by the way, he stood up to read that day. Or you may take the line, he went to Sabbath on, as was his custom, he went to synagogue on Sabbath day and stood up to read. Because that was his custom, was to go to synagogue on Sabbath day and read. And so he was involved in the worship, he was involved in doing it, he was part of that process. And then he finds the place in Isaiah 61 that talks about some of the promises of the Messiah and what the Messiah would actually look like and some of the things that it gives you about how this Messiah would be. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I am going to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captive, sight to the blind, the year of the Lord's favor. And as he does that proclamation, all of those things, he has all of these people who are sitting there who know him. Has he done that passage before? What passage does he usually do? That's one of the hard things about this whole process. You realize if you're going to stand up here and speak, you got to pick a scripture. You know, what am I going to talk about? Well... Which one of you am I going to talk? No, I don't do it that way. (laughs) You don't do it that way. So which scripture are you going to pull in? It's very intentional. It's not ever an accident. Well, let me just flip open a Bible and I'll pick that one. I'm sorry, that's a really poor preacher who can do that. I mean, anybody can start there and not going to say anything probably, but that's really the wrong way to do it. So I think Jesus here, as he gives this passage, is very, very intentional about it. And so as he gives this passage, he talks to them about Messiah and what it will be, and then gives them back the scroll and these words, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus picks the passage that is being fulfilled that very day. Well, of course. How else would you pick a scripture? Wouldn't that be the perfect one to pick? The one that's coming true that day? The one that's real that day? I mean, I guess you could pick a historical passage and say, well, way back then they used to do such and such. That's okay, I suppose. But that isn't what Jesus does. He picks a passage that relates to his life, to their life, exactly that day. Because after all, we've come for worship. And worship ought to be relevant. Worship ought to be exactly what God is doing in our life today. And so if we're going to pick a passage, if we're going to study a passage, then let's pick the one that applies to us today. And that's exactly what Jesus does because worship is for now. Worship is exactly for now. It's not just about all the things that have gone on. And it's not just about you learning what your Bible says. You can do that in Bible class, but worship is for now. And so he's giving the... Scripture that applies to them right then. And of course their response is a little bit varied from what I hope ours is today. Because they decide they're going to try to kill him. So let's don't do that one today. I don't want that part fulfilled. But as you look at the passages, no, this is what's done. And it is an Old Testament quote. It is from Isaiah 61. He says, this applies to right now. 
So when we look back at a Bible that was written so very long ago, does any of it apply to us right now? Yeah. The same way it did when Jesus says, this applies to you right now. It's a passage that was written a thousand years before. And now, he says, this is when it's coming true. So what scripture do you think Jesus would use today? If he was here today and he was preaching today, what passage would he use? What would his sermon be about? Well, what passage is being fulfilled today? What passage is most relevant today? Because worship is a response to God. And it's the reason why you're here. Worship is... Worship is not what happens up here. Okay? Worship is what happens out there. Worship is what happens in your pew. And that's what he's really talking about. Worship is not something that, oh, we did a good worship up here and everybody watched it. Worship is about what happens with you as you commune with God. And so I think that's what he's really trying to do. Trying to make a connection there. You see, if you go to a play and we watch the play and we can say, well, it, it, you know, it went great. I love the play. It was all good. But we were just watching them perform up there. And we might take something away that applied to us. He says, that's not worship. Because you're just observing somebody else who had all of this. Worship is this scripture applies to us right now. And I hope you get that today. The scripture that applies to you right now. Maybe you got it from Bible class. Maybe you get it from the lesson today. Maybe it's where you flipped your Bible to or someone else is going to share that with you. But also you have to realize as you're watching that play, sometimes you just had a bad day. And it's been terrible and it's awful. And you say, man, I hated that. That was terrible. Well, because my day was bad, everything I see turns out bad. You ever had days like that? just seems like everything goes wrong. And then there's those days when everything is good. Not because it's necessarily a better day than any other day, but because something good has happened. And it just takes one good thing to make all the rest of your day look excellent. And he says, that's really what worship comes down to because God has done some amazing things for us. And it's not about, well... You know, how am I feeling today? I've got to check myself out, feel, and say, well, it's, yeah, I'm normal. How terrible. And God says, no, you're not. You're worthy. No, you're not. You're filled with grace. No, you're not. You're loved. And so that's what God would have to say for us today. And that's kind of the passage that one of the ones that I had picked from Ephesians chapter 1. And starting in verse 3, it's one of those that Paul gives us. Is it's just kind of packed tight with all kinds of things that God does. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. That's a lot. There's hardly a period in there. And so as you look at all of this, it's like, wow, God has done so much for us. Does that passage apply to us today? Has God adopted you and blessed you with every spiritual blessing? And given you redemption and forgiveness and lavished you with grace and fulfilled his will in Christ in your life? 
I think it's one of those passages that is always true, and yet we can say, you know, I'm blessed, I'm chosen, I'm adopted, I'm accepted, I'm redeemed, I'm forgiven, and and why is your day bad? Okay, maybe you stubbed your toe or something like that, but I think this kind of outweighs all of that, doesn't it? And so what's my response now that I see all of these things that God has done? Can you feel your salvation from sin? Can you understand the holy and blameless and adopted and that God's plan is being played out in your life? And how do you express back to God your gratitude for all of that? You see, that's worship. It's all of the things that God has done and it's expressing back to God, here's what you did. Adoption and redemption and forgiveness and Grace is, and grace is amazing today, isn't it? And what an incredible thing God has done for us. And we realize and understand all of this is taking place right now. Did you suddenly get unforgiven? No. Are you still forgiven today even? I mean, even with the kids in the car and what you thought about on the way here? Yeah, it's still there. Grace is amazing, and we realize that, yeah, this is every day. And this is just a response back to God because he makes this passage apply to right now. And sometimes we need to focus on it and say, this is my passage. This is my worship back to God. One more I wanted to share with you is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And sometime we'll do the whole third chapter, but... As you look just at this first part of it, he tells them about them. And he says, as you know, you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So he says we're a letter from Christ because we're the message. And the message is put into us. He says the message isn't just what takes place up here. The message is also what happens in the pew. So it's not just uh, up here and we... This is the only one. You're the message as well. Because this message goes into your heart. It goes into the place where you are. It's the letter that is written. And people see it and they read it. And they realize it's written not with anything that's physical, but it's written with the spirit of the living God. Did you guys get any Christmas cards? Hopefully you got some. You know, they get the card and there's a picture and a little saying inside and they sign their name and you'll hear from them again next year, right? You think, oh, I have to send them another one. (laughs) A lot of the ones that we get, as well as the ones we send, have in it a story. Here's what happened this year. Because we only hear from these people once a year which makes it very nice that they will, you know, confine and describe all of their year events in one short letter. Okay, sometimes it's two pages, but most of them try to get it on one page. And, but here's everything that happened in my life. And what a great thing that is to be able to share that. And so we get those kind of letters that says, this is what God's been doing in my life this year. This is what has been happening in my life. And so it's a letter that's written that says, here's who I am. Here's what's going on in my life. You don't see it all the time. You realize also that this is not something that's just for now, but this was prophesied long ago. Back in Jeremiah 31, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. He was not able to do that until Christ. 
But when Jesus came, he's now able to send the Holy Spirit because it is that Holy Spirit that writes on your heart that makes all the difference. And he says, I'm going to put my law not just on tablets of stone, I'm going to put it inside of you. So that the message of God is not just kept at the church building, so that the message of God has now gone out into the whole world. And we have that confidence that he's working in us and that he's doing things in us and that we are pure and holy and blameless. And that kind of worship should convict us. It should call us to account because his law is put within us. And sure, we can see it. And yeah, we realize we fall short of it. What decisions do you make because of worship? Does it change what you do? Have you ever done that and come to Christ and, and come to worship even and, and sat and realized as the guy's speaking or realized as you're reading your Bible, oops, there's some things I need to take care of. There's maybe some people I need to talk to and I need to be able to ask some forgiveness. And it ought to convict us as we come before an almighty God and offer a response to him for what we have done and for how he speaks to us. So let me ask you, has God written something on your heart this morning? Do you come with praise and thanksgiving for what God's been able to say in your life about all of those great things? Have other people around you encouraged you? What is your message of God today? Do you have a scripture that's been fulfilled today? Are you able to realize that and say, yeah, this one works. I saw this. It says, God's law has been written on our, all our consciousness, but only in Christ is it written on our hearts. And I think maybe he's trying to get at the difference in what happens to us. A lot of people know the Ten Commandments. A lot of people intellectually know that God has given some commands, and yes, they feel guilty about them. But Christ writes it on your heart. He writes it there because it's how you feel, it's how you think, it's how you reason, it's your logic, it's every single part of what makes up your life. And that's what he's trying to describe. Can the people next to you read what God's written on your heart? We have a praise for God because of what he's made of us. Let me just ask, does your worship to God today lead you to any conclusions? Does it lead you to realize the greatness of God? Does it lead you to realize how wonderful he is? Does it lead you to maybe say, I need to improve. I need some prayer. Does it lead you to realize that you are truly blessed? Or does it lead you to say, I really need somebody else to help me talk to God? If we can do that, that's what we want to do. That's the other part of worship. We come together to encourage and uplift, and then sometimes we come together because we need to talk it out with each other and be able to pray to God. And if we can help you do that, we want to. Would you come while we stand and sing?